a beautiful Christmas vacation in their getaway home. That's all they ever wanted. But the intruders had a destiny planned for the family. Two survived, and two of them were shot dead. The vacation turned into a cold-blooded murder. This is the story of the Teed family. Christmas is often a time for celebration and family time. Like they always do, the Teed family headed to their cabin house in Utah. In December 1990, the Teed family decided to take a break from their hectic life and headed to their remote country cabin in Oakley, Utah. Ralph and Kate, with their two daughters, Trisha and Lene, aged 16 and 20 years respectively. The family was excitedly preparing for their annual Christmas party, to which the rest of the family was on their way. But they never thought that this would leave a scar on their lives. On a freezing winter day, three days before Christmas, this incident occurred, which shows the power of family, the strength of a father's love, and the Teed family's fight for justice. Ralph Teed was born on September 29, 1939 in Germany and moved to the U.S. with his mother when he was 11 years old. His biggest chapter in life started when he met Kate in his 20s. Though Kate was a few years younger than him and was from White Pine County, Nevada, Ralph and Kate fell in love with each other and married on May 24th. Soon after their marriage, they were blessed with a baby girl and named her Lene. Four years later, they were blessed with another baby girl, Trisha Teed. They soon relocated to Humboldt, Texas and led a happy life. Ralph started his business with commercial laundry solutions. In 1969, he became successful in his business and opened up Skyline Equipment, Inc. While Ralph was working day and night for his family, Kate was a devoted mother. She would give up anything for her children and also be a good friend to them. She had a very non-judgmental personality and was pure at heart. The one place they regularly visited every year for Christmas was the cabin house in Utah. The town in which the house was located was very small, with hardly around 600 people living nearby at that time. It was two and a half miles away from the main road. It's so isolated that with all the snow during the winter, they'll have to use a snowmobile to reach the house. Kate described the escape house as Teed's tranquility as it was isolated by an attractive river, not a neighbor in sight, and surrounded by towering aspen trees. In the winter of 1990, they made it to the cabin house as they always do. On December 20th, 1990, the family flew to Utah. They were eager to unpack, settle in, and prepare for the party. They drove to the iron gate near the house where the snowmobiles were parked. Then they loaded the snowmobiles with their luggage and supplies and rode to the cabin house in the brisk climate of negative 20 degrees Celsius. On reaching halfway to the cabin, Kate noticed a man wearing a thin jacket in the cold weather and walking. She stopped by and asked if he needed any help, only to realize that he was not dressed for the climate. He gave absolutely no response and walked away. The following day, after settling into the house, Kate told Rolf about the man she encountered and she was concerned about him. Kate insisted on keeping the gun with him as the man didn't belong here and was really strange. Ralph consoled her by saying it was just her assumption and everything was fine. Kate's sister also tried to convince her by saying crimes are really rare there and there had been only one non-fatal shooting in Utah. But Kate was not convinced and something inside her made her feel suspicious. As Kate was holding on to no for an answer, Ralph finally took the guns and placed them in the snowmobiles. The family then engaged in decorating the house for Christmas. They put up a big tree, stockings, and gifts they brought with them. All their spirits were high and joyful. It was the 22nd of December, and there was a lot to finish up before the party. Meanwhile, Kate's mother Beth joined them in the house. The whole family had to drive to the main road to buy a few things as they were running out of supplies. They drove through the snow on a snowmobile. Kate, Beth, and Lene were on one snowmobile, while Ralph and their second daughter, Trisha, were on another snowmobile. On the ride back to the house, from a far distance, Lene saw the shadow of a person in the master bedroom. She neglected to say that to anyone, as she thought that it was her cousin who was waiting to surprise them. Or maybe she was mistaken. A few minutes before reaching the house, Lene told her grandmother and mother that she would run straight to the house as she was freezing. On reaching the house, she did as she was told. As soon as Kate unlocked the door, Lene ran inside, up the stairs to the kitchen to dip her hands in hot water. She again saw a person hiding behind the fridge, and she was excited for her cousin to surprise her. Unfortunately, the man she thought was her cousin 
turned out to be a stranger. There came a frizzy-haired man in a gray sweatshirt, pointing a gun at Lene. She was shocked to see what her eyes were witnessing. He then asked her to call her family upstairs. But before she could say anything, her mother Kate came inside, helping Beth. While they were heading towards Lene, another man peeped out with thick Coke bottle glasses, pointing a gun at them. Kate sat her mother on a bar stool and tried to reason with the men. She asked what they wanted, why they were here, and if they wanted to take anything they wanted from them and leave them unharmed. But before she could hear a word from them or say anything else, the frizzy-haired man shot her and she fell. Seconds later, when Lene turned her back, she witnessed her grandmother being shot. Though Kate was alive and she tried to stand up, the man shot her again. This time, Kate died on the spot. Both her mother and grandmother were shot dead right before her eyes. Lene was still not able to process the happenings. She prayed for them, and she and the man shouted at her, saying these prayers wouldn't help them, as he is a worshipper of the devil. The frizzy-haired man seemed like the ringleader, as he was the one in command. They then took all the jewelry and cash Kate and Beth had with them and dragged Lene into the bedroom, where they stuffed a dirty sock in her mouth and sealed it with duct tape. They also tied her hands and legs so she couldn't move or break free. But the other man showed a glimpse of compassion by bringing their dog to her. Though this never made her happy, she was confused by his behavior. Meanwhile, she also heard the two men discussing disposing of the bodies. They finally decided to drag the bodies onto a redwood patio and cover them with snow. When they got back inside, they started cleaning up the mess they caused. And Lene even heard one of them throwing up as they felt sick due to the blood splattered all over. A few minutes later, she could hear the sound of a snowmobile approaching. Her heart sank when she realized it was her father and sister. When the ringleader heard the snowmobile, he grabbed Lene by the feet, wrapped his arm around her neck, and placed the gun tightly against her back. Lene felt so helpless as she couldn't warn her father and sister, who might face the same fate as her grandmother and mother. As Rolf and Trisha reached the house, a man wearing a ski mask ran towards them, pointing a gun. He ordered them inside the house to the side of Lene being held at gunpoint by another guy. Looking at Lene's eyes and tears, Ralph confirmed that his worst fears came true and that his beloved wife and mother-in-law were probably murdered by the intruders. They then ordered Ralph to hand over all the cash he had. He quickly swept his hands through his pockets and tossed $105 onto the floor and pleaded with them to let them free. The frustrated, frizzy-haired man commands the other guy to shoot Rolf. He obeys the commander and shoots, but unexpectedly, the trigger wasn't working. For over three seconds he tried, and suddenly the other man snatched the gun from him and pulled the trigger. The gun doesn't fire again. He reloads the gun and tries again. This time, it misfired twice. And the next shot was right in the face of Rolf, knocking him down to face death. Seeing this, Trisha weeps profoundly, and Lene wonders if there will be an end to this nightmare or not. One of them even thought of shooting Rolf one more time in the back of his head, but they decided to put gasoline all over the house and the bodies so all the evidence would be burnt down. They then took the girls, fueled the snowmobiles, and drove to the main road. They made the girls drive the snowmobiles to use them as a human shield, and the intruders sat behind them, pointing their guns behind the girls' backs. When they were near the iron gate, the girls were shocked to see their uncle Randy, who was on his way to the cabin. Seeing the girls, he waved at them, but the girls didn't respond to him. As Randy drove past them, he confirmed it was his nieces, and was confused why they reacted in such a way. He even noticed the guy sitting behind them, and thought they would be their boyfriends. One of the intruders even asked Lene who he was, and she responded by saying that she didn't know, and that he must be a friendly neighbor. If she hadn't said that, the intruders might have killed their uncle as well. They then reached their car, and the girls were forced to open the car with a number lock. The girls were forced into the car with a frizzy-haired man in the driving seat, Trisha beside him, and Lene and the other intruder in the back. In the car, the intruders discussed their plans with the girls. They promised to drive to New York and release the girls as soon as they arrived safely. But the girls never had any hope in those words and really doubted if they would ever be free from them. As they made it through the snow-covered road, they saw their uncle Randy again. This time, he was calling out their names and running towards the car while waving his hands at them, but the girls reacted as if they didn't know him. Randy watched and ran behind them, yelling to stop as his nieces ignored him. 
The man then drove fast, and when he thought the situation was clear, a Summit County Sheriff's vehicle approached them out of nowhere. This time, the intruders started to panic and drove even faster. They even sped through a roadblock to avoid the cops. They were riding at 90 miles per hour for roughly 40 miles. The chase ended as the car crashed. That was also not by accident. The frizzy-haired man shouted, It's time to die, and went off the road. Luckily, no one, especially the girls, were harmed. And soon, the police and public gathered around the car. The police were pointing their guns at the vehicle while Trisha held Linnea's hand to get out of the crashed vehicle. After a series of gunfire, the intruders and kidnappers were dragged out and forced onto their knees, with their hands on their heads. The police took the girls and assured their safety. Not being able to digest the fact that they were safe, the two men were caught, and their mother, father, and grandmother were dead. They shouted at the officers to kill the men. The girls said they killed their mom, dad, and grandparents. Kill them. Shoot them. Lene and Trisha were shocked that the police came to their rescue, even after no one was alarmed about the incident. However, the reality was something different. When their uncle Randy saw them riding the snowmobile, ignoring him, he felt suspicious. As he went towards the cabin, he saw someone approaching him. As the person got closer, he noticed that the person was not dressed for the weather. A man was running towards him with no sweater, socks, or gloves. It was not long until he realized that the man was none other than his brother Rolf. Yes, Rolf T., the girl's father, survived the attack and was alive. He was shot in the face, but he survived and was playing dead all the while, hearing all the conversations of the intruders. He played dead until they left and they heard the snowmobiles no more, and it was not time for him to die. The gun misfired and malfunctioned, and when they reloaded, they loaded it with birdshot, which played a massive role in his survival. When they left, Ralph got up and attempted to put off the fire in the cabin, but as he was covered in gasoline, his shirt caught fire. Regardless of him being shot, burned, and bleeding heavily, he tore the shirt and started fighting the fire again. He then realized he couldn't beat the fire, so he ran to the bathroom, washed, and went out to look for his daughters. As he was running towards the main gate, he saw his brother and told him everything. He said he was shot, his wife and mother-in-law had been killed, and his daughters were kidnapped. He managed to say, save them, before losing consciousness. Randy put him inside the car and drove to Canyon Road in search of the vehicle. On his way, he repeatedly called 911, but the service was really poor and his hopes were going down. He saw their family car as he drove and called out to the girls, to which they ignored him. In between all these, he finally got the service to call 911. While he was explaining the situation, the service went down again. He quickly stopped at a gas station and called 911 and informed them about the situation through a local phone. He also said he needed a helicopter to take his injured brother to the hospital. On arrival, the paramedics found out that Rolf was critical and airlifted him to the hospital, where he miraculously survived. When the daughters were told about the father's heroic moves, they were not surprised. For the girls, their father had always been a hero and an inspiration. Though the killers were caught, the police had some doubts about them. They investigated the crime scene. The police said that there were pools of blood and gunshots on the wall. They could smell the burnt room all over the house and the rotting bodies of Kate and Beth. One officer stated that the house looked like a mini war zone with things scattered everywhere and blood all over. In the basement, they saw spikes of blood frozen above the ceiling. It was a pool of blood from the above room falling down that froze due to the brisk temperature. The killers were identified as Taylor and Deli, who got out of prison a few days before the Teed family incident. After their release, the men stayed at a halfway house seeking employment. On December 14, Taylor and Deli walked away from the halfway house and hitchhiked to Oakley, Utah. They roamed Utah, robbing different homes. In fact, Taylor was the freaky stranger who Kate confronted on arrival at the cabin house. The men broke into the cabin, showered, and put on Rolf's clothes before committing the crimes. They planned on robbing them and driving away with all the money and items. But during the investigation, they found a video camera on which the men recorded their activities at the house. They prepared and ate food, slept on the bed, and waited for the family to return home. Deli filmed Taylor unwrapping all the Christmas presents and calling out the names of the family members written over the gifts. 
After this tragic incident, Claudia, Kate's sister, made sure that the girls never felt alone. Kate and her mother Beth were cremated on Friday, December 28th, as hundreds of mourners paid respect and support to the family. On January 22nd, 1991, Taylor and Deli were charged with first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder, as well as two counts of kidnapping, theft, and failure to heed a police signal to stop if found guilty. Both Taylor and Deli pleaded not guilty at first due to their insanity. Later, after the court evaluation, both Taylor and Deli were found legally sane and fit to stand trial. Five months later, Taylor pleaded guilty, and the prosecution argued Taylor was a cold-blooded killer who killed people without any reason or provocation. All the evidence and testimony, especially that of the girls, was against Taylor and Deli. Lene testified about how her mother and grandmother were shot right in front of her eyes and how they threatened her. Trisha told the jury how they treated her father and shot him in an attempt to murder him. Taylor testified that his acts were for self-defense, which was later proven wrong. The jury sentenced Taylor to death, and his attorney told the jury to consider giving him life imprisonment instead of the death penalty. The Teed family was unconvinced by this pleading, and after a while, he was sentenced to the death penalty. Finally, justice was served to the family. Taylor was going to be put to death by lethal injection. Deli, however, decided to check on his fate and stood trial. Deli was proven as a remorseless killer who deserved the death penalty, even though he was not the commander. Deli's lawyer said that Taylor was the ringleader who committed all the murders, and Deli was just a companion. The attorney grilled the Teed family during cross-examination. He questioned them if they saw Deli killing anyone. The attorney also said that it was Deli who took Lene to the bedroom and gave her their dog for company. He even proved that Deli was trying to save Rolf, as he never shot him, even after Taylor's command. The attorney closed the examination by saying Deli was befriended by the wrong person. The jury charged Deli with second-degree murder after 12 hours of deliberation. The Teed family was shocked to hear this, as they wanted both the men to face the death penalty, as they were both the reason for the darkest crime in the family. In May 1991, the jury foreperson explained that the jury didn't consider the convincing case of Delhi being responsible for the murders. Instead of finalizing a decision and subjecting the family to another trial, the court compromised the case with a lesser offense. Delhi was sentenced to life imprisonment with a chance of parole. Though the Teed family filed a wrongful death lawsuit for the murders of Kate and Beth, they were helpless as the way to get justice was through getting into their pocketbook. Ralph said the loss in their family had scarred them for life and they would forever mourn the loss of his wife and mother-in-law. Even with strong evidence, the court failed to give justice to the family in Delhi's case. In 2001, Lene received a letter from Delhi. In the letter, Delhi wrote that he had changed and was not the same evil boy she had encountered. He said he was sorry for the pain he caused her family. She read it dozens of times and it took her 10 years to reply by saying she forgave him. Ralph married three times after Kate's death. He finally felt happy when he married his last wife, who was also Kate's best friend, Donna. He spent many good years with her and his grandchildren, Lene and Trisha. They rebuilt their cabin house in Utah and spent vacations there with their family. Ralph passed away in 2008 due to cancer. He had his daughter Trisha, a divorced mother of two girls, and Lene with her second husband and their six children besides him. The girls live happy lives with their families and believe that whatever happens to them doesn't define them. Trisha's daughters kept her steadfast as they remind her of her mother and father, while Lene finds her happiness in her childhood best friend Nathan, whom she married after her first divorce. Meanwhile, Deli lives behind the bar, accepting his fate, and Taylor tries to appeal his sentence. In early 2019, due to Taylor's repeated appeals and his attorney's claim that the jury was showing injustice to Taylor, the court declared him innocent. With all these tragedies and injustices, the Teed family continues to cherish their time together and heal. With that, we have reached the end of the video. Let us know how you feel about the Teed family story in the comments section below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more such content. Until next time.